and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick with the City of Hampton. And today we are gonna meet someone who, while she was a film student at Thomas Nelson Community College, produced a very interesting documentary. Her name is Bobby Moore. Welcome, Bobby. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. It's great, it's great to see you and to hear about this project. I love it when people who are students or new to the area connect with the area's past. Thank you. So tell us about your documentary topic and how it came up. And obviously, I will say this was a student project and there were other folks involved as well. Yes. So I was part of a team of four students. We had uh, Zion Payton, uh, Carl Daniels Jr., and uh, Jarell Ocampo. And we were in an eight-week class in which we were tasked to come up with... Eight weeks is a short time frame. Eight weeks is an incredibly <laughs> short time frame uh, in which we were tasked to come up with a, a video. And we get to choose any genre that we wanted, to do, that we wanted uh, to, but to simply come up with a story. And the video um, was supposed to be five minutes in that time frame? Generally five <laughs> minutes. Eight weeks is a... <laughs> so five minutes was the target. Um, but I fell in love with the story. Um, it came to me through friends, family, friends who are like family, I should say. We were walking at uh, Buckrow Beach one day, and they began to describe this, this beach that had existed that was an African-American beach. They had grown up in, the, in segregation. And they started to describe this to me. Now, I am looking at a blank field. I'm looking at a housing development, and I'm thinking there was a... Bayside Resort here. That was known <laughs> throughout the East Coast. East Coast and even the world. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, okay, someday, <laughs> someday I'd like to tell this story, but not today because I have plenty of homework to do. <laughs> so you should say what the name is in case there are a few people out there who aren't familiar. It's called Bayshore Beach Hotel and Resort. Mm -hmm. And it uh, started in around 1897. So we've been, you know, following the reconstruction period, and it ended closed its doors in the, in the early 1970s. So it had quite long history. Um, well, the opportunity came a year later when I had this class project, and and I said, let's do this. I think it's a great story, and it, it just has a wonderful history. Um, now I didn't know all of it. All right, you had to do some a I lot had more to research. Do a lot of research, old articles old NAACP pamphlets um, going well, well back into history, far, much farther than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we began this and then, you know, just this series of a fortuitous events, meeting people who are passionate about Bayshore and then just beginning to start to tell the story. So we started with our goal of being a five minute video mm -hmm. and we ended up with a 20 minute documentary on Bayshore Beach that just introduces it to people. It doesn't get into a lot of the heavy history. It just introduces it so that people will you know, you want know, to know more about it. The generation of people who remember Bayshore is, um, there aren't as many of them. I mean, no. you did this at the right time yes. while there were still people you could talk to. Yes, we interviewed five people um, that actually show on camera. Of course, we interviewed a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but, for instance, uh, Samuel Scott, one of our interviewees, was one of the early African-American engineers at NASA. Now, when he was introduced to me, he was just introduced to me as, this is one of the, the last surviving regular lifeguards. Oh. Um, and I thought, oh, he's a lifeguard. But when we, and we, I think we interviewed him several times. Yeah, he was times. a lifeguard when he was probably in school. <laughs> well, he was actually a lifeguard off duty, I say off duty, but he was a lifeguard after work. So he would work after, you know, after work, after he left NASA, oh, wow. he would go be an, um, one of their lifeguards there, and then he would work on the weekends as well. So, but again, not from this area. It has a wonderful story. <coughs> I'm growing up in the South, and then of course how he went to um, Pennsylvania, learned to swim, became an engineer, and then later came here and worked at NASA. So he's 82, 83, early 80s. Wow. Um, very vibrant, very, very vibrant. We also interviewed um, Chuck, Chaver, uh, Chuck um, Guitar Chavis. Again, early 80s. Um, guitar player, grew up in Dog Bottom. Um, and then he you know, goes on to play, not only play at Bayshore Beach and be one of their phenomenal 
phenomenal musical acts, but he also goes on to travel with people like, um, I'm going to forget, figures I would forget now, but to travel with several well-known artists. Um, so it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Of course, early 80s. Linda Porter, uh, she's a local resident, been here, she grew up here all of her life. She was a young girl who worked there on, you know, the summers. And she would support her father's group. He had a group called Our, Our, Our World, a group of African-American men who were doing community projects, helping the community, supporting the community. And she was part of that. So she remembers, oh, I, we took p tickets for the dances. And so she really cool? describes for me the history and just brought it to life in terms of not only a place for people to go, but how it fit into the community. You know, you just had these um, characters, I would say, because they were just, just so different. But mm -hmm. they just represented the entrepreneurs, musicians, uh, local vendors. There's just this wealth of people. So I know your documentary sort of picks up in the later years, but let's set the stage for people. Um, when did Bayshore open and how unusual was that at the time? Um, it opened around 1897, just four cottages, and would later grow to 70 rooms plus. Um, very unusual, very unusual. Now there are a plethora of, um, that I came to learn, of African American beaches, segregated beaches. But because it, at the time there because was of, no other choice. Right. There were no other choices. Right. But sometimes it's in darkness when people are able to shine mm -hmm. the brightest and create these places that they're not only uh, retreats, but there were places where people could come and they're, and they're just themselves. And it was a safe place for them right. to really enjoy the beach and enjoy the water and to most importantly enjoy family. And, and it was literally side by side, side with by Buck side. Row, there was which a was you know, a big amusement park and, and resort mm -hmm. itself at the time. Yes, and there was a fence that separated them. God. And the fence started on shore and it extended out into the water. Oh my gosh. So, if you were a good swimmer, you could probably swim around it, but it, it, it extended yeah, into the water. Wouldn't have been a good idea, I'm yes. sure. Yes. <laughs> um, and so also in those early years, it was started by local Hampton, local Hampton. African American yes. businessmen, and they were probably mostly men then. Yes. Um, and they were investors in it and they co-owned it, right? Yes. I mean, I, I know a little history, but I'm yes. probably not as good as you are. Well, I, I know some of the, the and history. And totally famous people played there. I mean, it was on the circuit of East Coast right. places. Right, called the Chitlin Circuit. So it's places where African Americans, and the neat thing about this place is as an African American artist, you could play there and then you could stay there. Which is unusual. Which is also unusual because there's so many places where you could play, but once you had performed, you had to leave. And, you know, a lot of those places were not as classy as Bayshore. I mean, I remember Ruth Brown telling stories of playing in barns and being on that circuit. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, right. that was the nice place for miles. Yes, it was. It was. And the fact I'd love to do a, a subsequent story. We didn't, in 20 minutes. <laughs> And 20 minutes is pretty long. I mean, it's hugely long for a student project. It's long, but it, there's not a lot of time to tell the, to, to really get in depth mm -hmm. into the story. So um, one of the other folks that we interviewed, uh, Reginald Robinson, he has collected a lot of memorabilia and artifacts associated with there. Um, he'd gone there as a young boy about four years, but these years were significant emotional events that he, that just really, he just wants to share about that. So he does a program every year. He hosts a program yes. at the mm -hmm. Hampton History Museum to show people that. And, and he's got an them. amazing personal collection of artifacts. Yes. He has really done such a good job as yeah. the custodian. Absolutely. And so it was interesting to, to see his perspective as well. And then the last person, I know we also interviewed five people, <laughs> um, as I said, um, Martha Morris. So she is with the, the Buckrow Beach Historical Society and has done a phenomenal job collecting their history and then sharing with us and, and, and help guiding. All I had was one phone call and she says, here are the people that you need to talk to. Oh, that's great. And that just 
It just yeah, the Book Row Association has done yes. a much broader job and, and more inclusive because right. it's their area, it's their neighborhood, yes. Yes. and they've gone back into the complete history, yes. which is very, very nice. Yes, and you had, you know, you have the Dixie Rider in 1928 over at, at, at uh, Bayshore Beach, and it was quite, I think, $50,000, 1928, $50,000. Oh, my um, gosh. And then you had the very large amusement park over at, uh, Bay, at Buckrow as well. So, and, and so it survived the Depression, right? It did. And then a hurricane came through, the big, big hurricane. 1933. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. And so does your video... That's where it starts. So they've got the whole rebuilding. They're, they've got yeah. the glorious history and how much do they right. rebuild? And They rebuilt, rebuilt as much as they could. Um, certainly not as large um, as it was previously, not as close to the shoreline as it was, but that's where our story starts um, because that is where the question comes in. You know, you had this place which was the place for African Americans. Could it survive and could it rebuild? Mm -hmm. And then that's where, that's where we take off. Very few people res remember the storm. Um, yeah, yeah. But I was able to interview one person, a um, hundred-year-old African-American World War II veteran. Oh, wow. Now, this was not included. Um, he's a mentor that I met, kind of took me on, under his wings because we talked to each other as, you know, first as veterans. <laughs> and, and then, you know, he says, oh, back in my day. And I go, okay, so what were you doing in 1933? So, yeah, I remember that storm. And then he proceeded to describe it and describe you know, his early days at uh, Buck Row, uh, Big Shore Beach and, mm -hmm. and being in the Buck Row area. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty amazing. But there's not a lot of people around that actually remember the story. No, my neighbor used to tell me stories. She was over 100, she's passed since, but it's just so enriching to yes. hear that. And we all know that it could happen again, yes. that, that those hurricanes were very shielded by North Carolina for most cases, but it's, you know. Right. It's out there. It's always out there as a possibility. It's absolutely true. Well, so you mentioned veteran. This mm -hmm. uh, film thing is not your first career. Tell no. us a little bit about um, your first career. My first career I spent in the military as a civil engineer. Um, so it's creative, <laughs> but <laughs> more structured creative. Um, loved it, enjoyed it, traveled around the world, um, got to see so many different things, meet so many different people. Um, and that's perhaps why I'm in love with the narrative. I love stories and I love to hear about what people are doing, the things that they're creating. And I, I think, so when I retired, that was the time to kind of say, okay, what do you want to do? You know, you've worked hard, mm -hmm. so what do you want to do next? And that's how I fell into filmmaking and um, art and doing things like that. And so, of course, then, you're not from Hampton. You also grew up in a military family. I grew up in if a I military family. If I were asking you to count how many different cities you've lived in, it would Let's be. Let's not. <laughs> a lot. Let's not do math in public. Okay. Um, I will say, I can at least say three different continents. I think three different continents that I've actually lived on, four continents. So how did you settle in Hampton? Uh, it was a perfect place. Um, my parents are from North Carolina, just two and a half hours away, and this was really like home. It's close to the water. I love the water. Uh, family here, family, you know, from Carolina up to Washington, D.C., so it was just the, the perfect spot. And of course, Langley Air Force Base right here is where I you know, said goodbye to close the chapter on one life and open the chapter to the next. Well, you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me is um, I've interviewed a lot of people who are writing about our local history. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, George Siegel's writing about Whip. He's not yeah. from here. <laughs> or Greg, I'm sorry. Okay. And um, Tim Receiver is fascinated by Phoebus. He's now compiled two books. He's not from here. I mean, sometimes it takes an outsider mm -hmm. to see... Um, Marco Shetterly had to move away yes. and then realize at yes. some point how important mm -hmm. those early African-American mathematicians were to our history and, and uncover that. Now, yes. she'd known him growing up, but right. she had to go away first before right. she's like, oh, that doesn't happen everywhere. Right. <laughs> so it is so interesting that, of course, you're coming in with this filmmaker's eye, too, but 
to tell those stories. It is, and I think with anything, when you're close to it, it seems, it seems normal because that's all you know. Mm -hmm. But it's when you go away and you see it from a different perspective. You know, I would ask people, what's different about this beach than other African American beaches? You know, and uh, hopefully someday I'll get to tra I'll travel. I will. Once I make it up, make it up in my mind, I'll do it um, to go and compare. And there, there are differences. Um, so what do you do now? Are what you pursuing do I do filmmaking? What, yes. what is your next step? Up? My next step is I'd like to develop this a little bit further. Mm -hmm. um, there, I would like to just focus on music and the local musicians that play there. I mean, there's, a, a there's an incredible oh, yeah. number of musicians. Um, unfortunately, we're, we've lost and are losing oh, yeah. um, them daily. But and a lot of them weren't local. I mean, you a know. lot of them were not. But, but we the do local have local ones who are still here, and right. they, they would pick up as backup players, yes. you know, or backup singers. Yes. Practice like once, and and Absolutely. so adaptable and talented yes. that they could just jump in. You know, so you had the Ella Fitzgerald, the Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. You had um, just these incredible historical figures, and then you had local figures, like I said, uh, Chuck Chuck Chavis, who just amazing. You know, he can still take that guitar and put it behind his head and play, and and it's just amazing. There's this talent. And the way people's eyes light up when they talk about the music. Yeah. You know, yeah. They talk about that place. And so it's a very, it's very, very special. And we had local musicians that played there that actually went national. Mm hmm and So that was really a neat, neat thing to see. Yeah. Well, I think we should quit talking and okay. let people watch the, the video. I think that's an important piece of this. You've, you've set it up nicely, and I know they're out there going, okay, quit talking. I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, Bobby. You're very welcome. And stay tuned um, to watch her documentary, hers and her fellow students' documentary about Bayshore. August 23, 1933, a massive hurricane struck the Hampton Roads area, leaving death and destruction in its wake. The Bayshore Hotel and Resort was especially hard hit. Since 1898, the resort was one of few beaches on the East Coast that was open to African Americans. The facilities that remained were white only, leaving African Americans who visited nowhere to go. As they sort through the rubble and debris left along the sand, one question remained with the long-time resort for African-Americans recover. My first encounter with the Bayshore Buckro combination was in that summer of 62 when I brought my wife and my, my pregnant wife and my daughter here to sit on the beach and kind of relax and enjoy ourselves. Uh, next thing I knew, I had several large guys playing football over top of my pregnant wife and, and my daughter, who was two, year, two and a half years old at the time. And uh, I asked them to, to stop playing football on the beach. And they wanted to fuss at me and next thing I know, a policeman came down right over here <clears throat> and asked me to leave. And I said, why should I leave? I said, they're the ones causing the problems. He says, well, you don't belong over here. I said, what do you mean I don't belong over here? He said, no, your beach is over there. So I said, well, what's over there? He said, it's called, I think it's called Bay Shore. I was raised in Peepas, which is a few blocks from Buckro Beach. And that was the place that you went through in the summertime to have fun. Um, that was the beach for people of color. Um, the other folks were on the other side of the fence. We could see them, but we couldn't go over there and be with them. But we had fun where we were. I remember the first time walking through the gate at age 14. I was so thrilled to be able to go to Buckrow to Bayshore Beach, because everybody, that was a spot on weekends for us. My experiences would begin probably in the mid-60s when I was 
three or four years old, my mother would come in the uh, living room and I'd be in there watching cartoons like most kids on Saturday morning with my little dog right beside me. And she'd say, you want to go to the beach next weekend? I'd say, hey, yeah, why not? I didn't ever go fishing much as a little kid. And the fishing pier was the divider between Bayshore and Buckrow. And I knew that there was a separate beach down there because both of my parents worked. And my mother taught school and my dad worked at the shipyard. And we had somebody that watched us after, you know, elementary school when we got off the bus until my mom got home that was black that lived on Burgess Avenue, which was right off Old Buckborough Road, a couple of streets down from where my parents lived. And I knew of Bayshore, but it just didn't click to me. You know, when I think about it now, my black friends that were, my friends that were talking about it were black, but it, dumb white girl, I guess it never clicked to me that that's a black beach, that's white beach. They had that anchor fence there that separated Bayshore from Buck Row. And you could stand and just look through there. And you could stand there and talk to each other if you wanted to. And the whites would look over at us. And they envied the music they heard because during that time, everybody loved the same music. It went all the way from the shore, well, up on the shore, really, all the way down into the water. It was so far into the water um, that it would have been too high for us to go around it anyway. Across the street from those houses where that big empty lot is, it was the parking lot. Um, from the parking lot right along that edge before you cross the street were vendors with uh, fresh oysters, fish, <clears throat> things like that they'd sell. Um, and then you cross the street about midway that where that block is right now was the gate for admissions. And I don't remember how much it cost to get in, but it wasn't much. We had to pay to get in. Inside the beach, the minute you walked in the gate, there was those little, I call them bump rides, where you bump into each other, you ride them. And then you walk a little bit into the lift, there was a beer garden. Um, then you get inside the beach. <clears throat> to your right would be the cars, the bumper cars, the boats, little boats that little people could ride in, um, the horses, or the carousel, they call it, we call them hoppy horses. Um, was next, and behind that was the Ferris wheel and the swings. Um, to the left was a covered picnic area where the picnic tables were. Because you know, we don't like to be in the sun, so it was it was covered. Um, and you'd go early to get your if your family was having a, a picnic or something, they'd send somebody early to hold on to your table till the rest of your family got there. I think there maybe was 25, 30 tables under there. And then if you went down the walk a little further, you crossed the walkway and on your left would be the hotel, the Bayshore Hotel. I can remember that big green hotel with the, it, the green roof. It had the green uh, skin or whatever you would call the sign into it. The, the windows were trim and dark green. And, it, it, and I always remember, like I said, that fun house. It was a white cinder block building with two great big wooden green doors and on each door were painted pictures of ghostly spirits. One smiled and one didn't. And a lot of the time, most of the time, really the jukebox was put outside and there was, there was a cement area so the kids would dance out there. And then you go around the corner and the pavilion was there. And then the big dance hall was sitting right to the right and then on the beach, they had the little hut houses. Then there were more games. So you could spend the whole day just messing around down there. That was the only place to get into the water. There, there was a swimming pool in Newport News, but we didn't have one in Hampton for us. Not while I was growing up. One came later. But, um... There wasn't one. 
So to get it in the water, you went to the beach. The owners of the hotel, <clears throat> Mr. C.H. Williams, and, and at that time, Walter Jones, <clears throat> asked me if I wanted to be a lifeguard. And I said, well, I work full time. He says, well, I just need you on the weekends and on a regular basis when you can come down in the afternoons. I said, fine, I'll do that. So I became a lifeguard at Bayshore Beach um, in uh, the summer of 1963. My first memory would probably be um, that's an emotional one. That would probably be uh, me and my mother at the beach. Because, you know, we, like I said, we used to get in the water together. And it would be me sitting there with my sand, with my bucket, playing with the sand. And her with her one-piece <laughs> one bathing suit on. It was a black bathing suit. And I could just see her standing there, trying to make sure I didn't go too far in the water. Because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't swim. And she couldn't come here because she couldn't swim either, so. Uh, our biggest trouble were the floats that they rented out and the people went a little bit too far out who could not swim, but they were on a float, so they thought they were safe. Well, they fell off, and we always had to go get them. Two ladies were out on a uh, float, <clears throat> and uh, one fell off, and she couldn't swim, and she's out there flailing in the water. So I jumped down off the lifeguard stand, uh, swam out there, and when I approached her, I was afraid that she was, I uh, left early, so I was afraid that she might be uh, underwater and I couldn't get her. So I ended up leaving my whistle hanging around my neck. <clears throat> and when I got to her, she lunged for me and grabbed my whistle and started to try to pull me under because she was holding on to me. So I just pushed her down, pushed her head down under the water and just held her there for a few seconds <clears throat> until she let my whistle go. Then I dived, I dove under her and then came up the backside of her and grabbed her around the neck like that and started going in. My grandson told, told me he wouldn't dare go in that water while I was jellyfishing. I don't think we thought anything about the jellyfish. The jellyfish was stinging, so we'd run out, put some sand on it, and go back in the water. You know, so um, I don't know why there were never any fish <laughs> in that part of the water. Even though we had a fishing pier too, I mean, you know, Buckrow has the nice fishing pier. We have one on the Bayshore side also. The biggest thing Bayshore had at that time, after the storm, tore it down. It tore everything down back in the 30s. But the whites had the money to build us back. The blacks didn't. And the biggest thing we had on Bayshore at that time was the dance hall and entertainment. We brought the stars down. A pavilion where we held all of the um, uh, functions for sororities, uh, fraternities, uh, Masonic uh, lodges, the, the large functions. We had cotillions there. We had big dances, big R&B entertainment, big jazz entertainment, and even big band entertainment before I came when the, the uh, large bands uh, used to come here. I saw the kids dancing, and I said one day, I'm going to be on that stage. I kept telling myself, one day, I'm going to be on that stage. And at the age 20, I got on that stage. And I opened up for Count Basie. And after that, my career jumped. The funniest moment was having James Brown in the little place on the corner. And he was talking about Virginia women and how they had the biggest legs in the world. <laughs> uh, and actually selling him, you know, what we were selling in the grill. Um, he, he talked about the pavilion and how we could dance. And he was just like a regular person. He was fun to talk to. He put on a good show, too. We envied their rides, they envied our music. And whenever the stars would come in town, oh, they would still just stand there and just listen. And I never forget when Fest Domino came down. 
This one white guy, he wanted to hear Fast Domino so bad. They said, man, you can't come over here. This is segregated. The Rotten Cabanas got to be hot, 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 hot. We were so hot around here, we won everything. And we were the band that left here and went with Otis Redding. We got famous with him. And the Rock Cabanas were hot. They were famous around here. Famous, famous. That was a famous beach. A lot of stars came there. A lot of stars. I have a hard time with that. I don't know how to verbalize what a very cool place and what an important area that was. Especially from the 1900s up through, you know, the 30s and 40s was huge. There weren't choices for people like there are now. You know, that's the thing everybody lived for. Like Reginald Robinson will tell you, coming to Bayshore in the summer, you could, you know, as you're coming down North Mallory Street, you could hear it. And you know, that was exciting. We could, everybody would meet down there, call himself Colton. We would buy the popcorn and uh, we were going in the uh, dance hall and I was just getting started then and the bigger bands were playing. And then when I got my break to be on stage, I took it. I took advantage of it. And after that, I became their hometown hero. Um, but when it first when they first integrated, there was a line, one line going to Buck Row and one line coming from Buck Row. Because people would go over there and then they'd turn around and come back. So there would be this line of continuous people going from Buck Row to Bayshore and from Bayshore to Buck Row. You know, um, that was sad to me. Because there were things you could do at Bayshore you couldn't do at Buck Row. Like put your blanket up to keep the sun off you. You know, things like that. Um, just lost it. Bayshore were was a pioneer within itself. Bishu was a pioneer for all of us. In this day and age, uh, what we're going through, you can't take for granted these freedoms that you have. Sure, you can go to Nags Head and rent a, a cottage down there, or you can go to, uh, what, Florida for uh, spring break. But I must remind you that less than 50 years ago, you couldn't go there. The saddest one was when they closed the beach, when there was no longer a bay shore. Um, when you get these very serious black people coming together to uh, form a bay shore and go through all of the trials and tribulations through storms and, and this, that, and the other, and have that available to the black child, the black baby, or let's say the black baby, the black child, the black teen, the black adult, and the black grandparent. Um, you know, that's an amazing feat that nobody wants to recognize. But it's an amazing feat, uh, even in the days that they came up and did it. Where that anchor fence was, where that marker is now, that plaque they put there, is right on the line. They couldn't go across the line because it's on private property. But that line is where the two beaches separated each other. Bayshore was, it was a business um, owned and operated by us. Um, It's important that we know we had our own, that we weren't dependent on other people. Uh, that's it, it's a matter of being like independent. Um, we had that business going, it was ours. Um, we could do things our way. We didn't have to conform to something somebody else was doing. But a lot of stars came there, a lot of stars. A lot of stars were born there. A lot of stars were made there. I was made there. And today I'm a, today I'm a celebrity. 
the bands played in the pavilion, and they had dances in the pavilion. My daddy's club, the Hour Club, had dances in the pavilion. Other clubs did. We had real mm, stars to come in that pavilion. And then there was a band staying outside on the sand, too. The bands would come out there and play. So it was um, that kind of stuff that we lost. Oh, I, I get a little full sitting here talking about Bayshore. Because if you would live it like I lived it, and I'm sitting there looking at it right now, I can see every spot on that beach right this second. Even the color of the sand, even the lifeguard walking up and down the beach, I can see that right now. Bayshore was all we had, whether it was an acre or, or the eventual eight acres that it became. That was all we had. You had a hotel, you had a place to eat, you had rides, you had water, you had sand, you had relative safety. You were all of, you had all that safety right in that little area where you had to not worry about the, the problems of the world. It was, it was, Bayshaw was a world amongst itself where you could just enjoy yourself and you didn't have to worry about anything.